quite a good, good. quite a common practice these days and i think it benefits uh, the universities it benefits the students and staff yeah. alike i think it's it's a, yes. it's a good good way of communication between peers yes and uh, i request please uh, refer someone who you think is valuable then tapati will follow it up and <laughs> on this platform we want to meet a diverse uh, architects so yeah we invited even an architectural photographer he is a photographer by profession but he is into mm -hmm. architectural photography so mm -hmm. he shared his experiences and uh, the way the whole preparation has to be done say if you want to document your project uh, yeah. and uh, the whole effort that goes into it he, sh he shared nice stories about uh, his experience working with uh, uh, very senior architects uh, photo uh, documenting their projects so whole st uh, whole spectrum of architecture <laughs> so we had an architect who designed airbus industry in germany so oh wow he, that's amazing he, yeah he was on this platform then uh, many of our indian architects who are working uh, all around the world uh, so they they are aware also on this platform so it was nice experience connecting to all these wonderful people and in fact we had few architectural couples speaking on this platform <laughs> yeah mine is going to be very humble very personal pro like this journey i'm going to that's talk what a bit we, about that. we want uh, we want <laughs> your personal journeys your personal insights and uh, how you could uh, create a niche for yourself in this uh, career right and uh, what are you looking ahead still because yeah. uh, the journey like it's not the destination that is important it is the whole journey that is important for an architect right so mm -hmm. so what is the journey that you are looking forward that is what makes uh, important for all these young students so that no uh, whenever they are in a situation they would definitely relate okay this is what they have done then yeah, <laughs> yeah. and i should thank tapati for uh, uh, creating this space for uh, you to interact with our students yes i i see one of my very dear friend is also here akanksha okay we are from the same <laughs> cohort uh, and Tapati is from, uh, she's a senior of mine. Yeah. So same university. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Actually, I was waiting to introduce Akansha also because she's the one who referred uh, Mona to us. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Let's start then. Uh, I think more or less uh, people will join as soon yes. as we progress. We, gen we generally have at least 30 of them. So maybe five, 10 minutes more. But it's all right, Tapati. After some time, it is, uh, again, we are coming back, no? <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, so a very good morning to everyone. I am Assistant Professor Tapati Banja and I welcome you to Geetam School of Architecture webinar series 2023 on the topic Successful Career in Architecture organized by Geetam School of Architecture Hyderabad Vishakapatnam for the aspiring students of architecture. Today we have architect Mohana Das with us to talk about her journey and experience. So, uh, once again, I introduce to you uh, Professor Sunil Kumar Ji, Director, Geetam School of Architecture, Hyderabad. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Sir, would you like to say something? Yeah. So, <clears throat> uh, Geetam is a deemed university and uh, it has uh, been there for a long 40 years of journey. And the School of Architecture in Vishagapatnam, we started uh, 13 years back and five years back in Hyderabad campus. So this is the journey of School of Architecture. So we just graduated the first batch three months back from Hyderabad. Yeah, the second batch is uh, in their internship. And uh, we, we created this uh, platform so that our students uh, uh, can learn from senior architects their journeys and how they crafted their journeys, their careers. So, uh, welcome here, Mohana. I'm very uh, hopeful to see your presentation. 
Thank you so much, Professor Kumar. Thank you so much. Yes. It's a pleasure to be here. Yes. Um, do, do you think we should start with... Yes, yes. But before me. that, let me just introduce a bit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so moving on, today's speaker, architect Mohana Das. Mohana is presently a PhD candidate in the School of Design at Poly A, where she is investigating how to improve the design strategy already in place to foster well-being in Hong Kong existing long-term care facilities. The researcher who has 13 years of experience in architecture and designing healthcare related spaces focuses on bridging the gap between theory and practice in developing spaces for community dwelling seniors. So uh, as I was reading your bio, I was very interested that you are kind of doing work in care facilities, right? So can yeah. you just tell me what's your experience in doing that? How did you find, I mean, how did you decide you want to do something in this area? I think uh, it will... I'll come across through this entire process of how did I reach to what it is uh, as a PhD topic after this entire 14 years of uh, uh, experience. I think I would drop in with the uh, presentation and then follow along the entire sequence okay, because I yeah. just carried out with that presentation so that, you know, the, everyone who's listening. So it's something that I always say to even my students and um, current students, old students, that it's a very personal journey. So even if you are given the same set of choices, um, set of situations, their trajectory would be very different than what I have. So it will be, it's a very unique individual uh, experience, but uh, I would like to share mine. Um, yeah, sure, let's, let's go ahead with that then. Can you see my... You started, just wait, huh, yes. But uh, do you see the entire screen or do you just see the presentation? I can see the presentation on the next slide. Can you, uh, I mean, you haven't full screened it, I guess. But, uh, let me see. There is a... Um, no. No. Speaker, yeah. Uh, okay. We can usually stop this next slide and maybe this, but still you see the black portions ah, of it. Right? Yes, yes, I can see it, but it's okay. Yeah. Does it work? Yeah, okay. It should be okay. So I think um, this is the poster most likely much of you who are here have seen this. Uh, not sure about how about successful career in architecture, but um, um, I made this as my uh, title, which was more about uh, experience sharing session that I want to have with all of you and probably learn something from you, what you are planning to do by the end of the session. And um, also about how to, how would I describe my path and how to unveil the path of an architect, uh, a student's journey and insightful reflections. So I'm Mohana. And briefly, for the next few minutes, few more minutes, it would be about uh, my educational journey uh, for the past 15 years and uh, followed by some brief snippets of my ongoing PhD. I don't want to bore you guys with the research that I'm doing in details, but feel free to ask me later if you're interested. Um, also, I wanted to share just a brief um, uh, part of uh, University of Manchester visit as a visiting scholar that I did very recently. Uh, just to give you an example of maybe much of the students are very excited about uh, studying abroad. Um, you should always have some different uh, reasons rather than also studying, being able to study outside the quality of university, the rankings, the stream, many things are important. But um, I'll just show this Manchester side of mine, uh, how it went. And at the end, I'm looking forward for a very interesting Q&A session. If you're up by then, if you're not snoring by the end of it, I hope not. So uh, as I said, past 15 years, I think I have for the longest of times, as I remember, I've been doing architecture. So I started my journey with uh, me doing diploma in architecture in India. 
which is uh, uh, for three years. It is still a three years degree and much, not many, but then there are always few students in every cohort I see that they have done diploma as well. So minority, uh, but then yes, uh, it's a big upper hand, whoever has done a diploma and then comes for bachelor because Diploma in architecture in itself, it's a very compact course. Um, you would know almost everything that has been taught in bachelor, but then there's it's in a very compact version uh, in diploma, right? Um, with diploma, since it's three years, the backside of this degree is that um, you don't get to design uh, freely. You don't have the signing authorities for certain types of buildings because of the restriction of the diploma degree in itself. So that was, um, we are all uh, studying, pursuing architecture here. So there's no reason for me to explain why I chose architecture. Um, but once I started doing architecture, uh, my diploma degree, I was in love with architecture already. Um, then I decided, of course, there's no stopping. I'm going to do more. And uh, right away, I finished my diploma. That very year, I joined my bachelor's degree. Uh, in Pilumudi College of Architecture, we have many students from there, colleagues from there. I often see PMCAs everywhere, I guess. So we do have my dear friends and seniors from PMC as well here. So all the marks and scores, they don't matter much, but then it helps you to succeed or get the universities you are looking out for. Uh, it gives you a better chance. So that's why I put the numbers. You might just think that second is my favorite number, of course not. But then in diploma, I got the second highest score, missed by a few marks, I guess. And then that was the second highest score in West Bengal. I think that helped me to get uh, a better chance at getting the admission in bachelor's. When I finished uh, my bachelor's, five years of bachelor, right, in India, uh, I got the second highest score in BPUT, which is, I guess, all the universities in Odisha. And um, I think that is something that you can also put it in your portfolio, right? You can build your CV like that, that that one asterisk near your degree that makes a difference. I have seen over the time. That, that being said, uh, that's not a reason for those who couldn't um, because uh, that will not get you to any place. But this is something that if you have, you put it. There is no um, bad marketing, right? So if you can put it, if you have it, then you definitely have to add it in your portfolio, in your CV. Um, so along with my bachelor's degree, uh, the first three scorers of that year were offered to join uh, Pilumodi College of Architecture. So did I join uh, PMC again, uh, now being on the other side of the table, right? Being faculty. and um, so one and a half years of that very interesting year. I took that year also because I wanted to pursue my master's and I wanted to have the time and also a financial backup, right? So if I want to take one year of building my portfolio and not do anything, I think that could have been an option, but I chose to um, teach as well. That was another side of what architects can do, either practice, or teach or do it both. In my case, I did it both. So I was teaching at that point of time, um, made some amazing memories and met amazing students. They are the first year students of mine. So it was a very personal um, uh, achievement as well to see how they're doing now. They are still in contact. Um, I did several personal projects uh, with my father and um, yeah, so being in practice, being in uh, academia and building portfolio, that was something I did for the next one and a half years before I started to, or during I was uh, preparing for applying to universities. So uh, before getting into master's, I think uh, one of the underlying reasons was definitely that I love to travel. So that was one thing that I was uh, interested in looking out for masters. But another important um, decision uh, or criteria that I had for myself was to have scholarships. So uh, it's good if you don't have um, 
to be dependent on anybody else, right? You can take education loans. You can be uh, taking assistance from your family, which Indian families are more than happy to do it for you. Uh, but better if you can get in scholarship. So look out for scholarships. Um, the first year, second year, third year students, you do not need to worry about all of these now. Uh, if you want to pursue masters or not, keep that in mind. Take how you are going ahead with it. If you like the practice side of it a lot, even though masters help with that, but uh, yeah, take up on internships, uh, have this practical experience, and then decide if you want to take up on uh, masters or you want to progress with the uh, in practice. It's a very individual again, very unique uh, circumstance for you to decide what you want to do. So um, I started looking for masters with all of these criteria. has to be a good university, has to be, I was not very specific uh, whether I want to do it in India or outside. So I started looking out for universities in India, uh, the good ones um, like um, SEPT. Uh, I think I got an admission in SEPT as well. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, so I think uh, I started doing that. And at the same time, I started apply, uh, applying in um, top ranked universities in other parts of the world, but with scholarship. That was my main criteria that I should have a scholarship. So then I started uh, applying and I got admission into Politecnico di Milano, which is in uh, Italy. And it is a uh, rank one uh, university in Italy, the first ranked university. And also it, it has a good QS ranking over uh, the global ranking as well, I think top 60 and top 10 in architecture. So it definitely revolves around top five. This year it's sixth ranked uh, university uh, in, for architecture in the world. So having, uh, getting an admission there with a scholarship, I think that's a very good moral boost, right? So I think that that, that kept me going. And to take this uh, also a big decision of, you know, going to another country, be prepared for all the things that comes along with it. And I finished my master's. And after that, of course, I had this uh, vision in my mind of how I want to uh, navigate my career trajectory. And I was very sure that I'm going to do my PhD right after my master's as well. So I took another few months and almost a year to prepare the proposal, applying, because it takes time. It might look these four sentences of diploma, bachelor, master's, and PhD, but this one slide is talking about 15 years of things that has been put to make these four lines happen. So, um, yeah, so then PhD happens. Coming back to Tapati's uh, uh, question, Again, not right there yet. I'll be talking about it as a conclusion of how this entire thing ended up into the PhD that I'm doing. So yeah, the journey of India uh, and then Italy and then United Kingdom and then Hong Kong for the next two years, one or two years at least. So the first two part, which is in India and uh, my teaching experience, all of these, um, I started uh, doing my competitions since we are talking a little bit about competitions as well in my first half, I'll talk a little bit on that. Um, I'm not going to explain or I'm not going to show you how uh, competition can be dealt with because every competition, the, the brief is different, the context is different, the kind of requirements are different, but um, it's a process. So uh, right from my diploma days, I applied to several competitions, small ones. I don't remember I did anything big in diploma. I won though, but then it was not something mention worthy. But then what happened was that it prepared me to take on bigger uh, chances, to take bigger leap of faith, right? So when I was in my first year of bachelor already, uh, I started applying for national competitions. Uh, uh, I did one in IT Rurki, I think I did several zona every every year zona sa was my thing i think it's yours as well it's a fun event um also you could show your competitive side and make your university proud as well at the same time 
So acumen, um, what else did I do in um, bachelor's? I think, yeah, the, most of it was that I can't name in numbers, but then I did a lot of them. I won and then I lost. But then what happened in applying through those competitions is that it gives you a sense of um, uh, confidence. Uh, you grow on your uh, way of uh, putting across the sheets. So even if you lose, what I always do is I take a look back, I sit back and then I take a look at the sheet that I did and then try to understand why it didn't work and the winning uh, entries, how and what was the difference between that to mine and where did I went wrong? Uh, where did I go wrong? So that I can, you know, not do it or not repeat it next time. Trying. Uh, you That's the process, I guess. So... This is my bachelor's uh, thesis. I just took a screenshot from my portfolio. Um, this was something I uh, started doing uh, about designing hospital spaces. I was very interested by mid of my architectural journey when I was very, very interested into designing hospitals. Uh, it's very interesting in hospital designing because, you know, in hospital, there are places, there are spaces which you cannot... Uh, show your creative side. It has to be uh, following certain sequence, certain uh, space arrangement, certain space requirements. You can't be like, oh, I'm the architect or I can design spaces however I want. But at the same time, there are other spaces uh, where you can show your creative side being an architect and how you can change the mood of hospital to make it non-hospital like, right? You're always associating uh, hospitals as a space where you get tensed babies or children or even even my dad I think he would be scared to go to hospital because of the notion that he's attached to hospitals so how to shift that idea I think I have worked a lot on that spectrum uh, and it started from my bachelor days as well so then I wanted to do something for my bachelor's thesis because I was highly interested on in doing that so I turned this uh, project and then um took a chance. I had just a week left. And uh, one of the person who really helped me putting this into the NIASA award uh, for that year for thesis, it's a national award uh, category for architectural thesis. Uh, she's here present today, Akansha. I think we all took it as a common project challenge. And then we all sat together, put the uh, contents into the format that NIASA asks for. And then the result was, uh, it was one of the top 10 theses for that year and uh, was awarded being that. Um, nothing, it, it feels uh, nice to be appreciated for sure. It, it And it helps to build your CV. It doesn't change anything from day zero to day one after all these competitions, but it just builds on the experience. And I think the confidence that you have um, does it change? No, it doesn't change. Okay, sorry. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm sharing my part of the CV, which you can find uh, it's there in LinkedIn. Uh, those who are there in LinkedIn, congratulations. Those who are not, please get into LinkedIn because this helps you in lens to connect with your peers, to get a job, to show your progress, to this is this is the place where you should be uh, so my cv is already there but what i wanted to show it's not an updated one uh, mind you so i just shared some of the competitions that i've done over the years uh, from 2012 to 2022 some are international competitions some are national competitions part of it i haven't added once that I could not leave my um, excitement to participate in com competitions here as well. So in PhD as well, I was participating. And unfortunately, we have won a few competitions here as well in Hong Kong. So as, as a summing up of the experience, I think uh, it's like um, for the competitions, what I would say is that the brief has the key to winning a competition all, already. It's all there. So you have to carefully read and understand the brief a lot many times. Read, read, and reread. And uh, what you are supposed to do by reading it a lot many times, it gets into your head, the entire brief, what the 
uh, client per se, the competition wants you to deliver. And look out for the clues that it has. It has most of the things. It has all of the things that you would require to design the best design for that particular problem. But the thing that is very necessary in ad adopting uh, strategies for the competition or for the design proposal in general in life, it's about having the clarity of ideas uh, and the logic behind putting what you're putting in that particular place, right? It goes for your current design courses that you're doing, the ADGs and what all the subjects that you're doing. Uh, it's about sometimes what happens, you don't want to let go of some great ideas that you have while you're sleeping, while you're taking a shower, something comes up and you're fixated on putting that into your project. Maybe it works, but sometimes you somehow know it doesn't work. The logic is not right, but yet you are fixated on putting it. Sometimes that leads to the outright rejection of the competitions for that matter. Because in competitions, unlike the design uh, semester, the courses that you have, you have the chance to explain, you have the chance to uh, show, get corrected, uh, do it again. But in when you're submitting for competitions, it's like one-time chance, right? So I think um, if you have the clarity of ideas and the logic is right, I think most half of the battle is won there along with great presentation, uh, visual presentation of the project. So most of the competitions in international standards, you don't get to even present. So the selection happens, the juror just looks at your presentation and selects or throws it away, right? So um, it's not even half the battle one, it's more than that if you have succeeded in creating a good uh, presentation of the sheet in itself, if it's logical, if it's comprehensive enough. And um, sometimes when you get to present, like the national ones in NIASA or other uh, competitions, where you would have to present as well. So then there is the second chance of you to win competitions because you get to present your ideas. Maybe a certain uh, amazing, brilliant element that you have added in a corner that you didn't put in the sheet. I don't know why you should have. But if you didn't, then you get a chance to at least take that out and present in your presentation uh, day so that you get the attention of the jurors, right? So I think presenting the entire ideas coherently and confidently is the next uh, key to winning competitions. If you do this right uh, for any competitions, plus a little minor uh, here and there of things that might go wrong, but most of the times I think this has been my recipe for the success of the competitions that I have participate again. Um, just to give a small snippet of uh, some of the competitions that I have done and won. This is a multi-comfort students uh, St. Gobain competition. Um, this I'm sharing from my portfolio. So it's a very broken, uh, very separated, explained versions of what I did. But uh, the sheet uh, looked something like this. It will take time, it's heavy, I think. It's going to take time. Let it take time. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, this was the entire sheet that we presented, uh, we submitted. But in this uh, criteria, this kind of competition, we had the two-way chance to win. What one is the presentation of the sheets that I said. We submitted, it got selected in the entire Italy it got into top 10 first, and then we had the chance to present amongst international jurors from uh, St. Gobain and uh, uh, the local municipal uh, government uh, officials. Uh, what we did uh, have was we presented again uh, in front of them. And I think in this competition particularly, the presentation was the winning uh, key and not the sheet in itself. I think we did a good job in explaining right from the scratch of how the brief was given to us. We had existing buildings, we had new plots, and we had to take the entire design from that to a very specific housing unit where the thermal comfort has been taken care of and how the uh, design will help. Uh, in passive and active ways. So it was a very long uh, brief and a lot of things had to be done. And I think for this case, the presentation was the winning criteria. This was another competition uh, we won in Czech Republic in Spirelli competition. It's one of the largest students uh, architectural competition. You might be interested in taking part. 
currently I'm a juror here, but uh, at that point of time when I was a student, this um, submission criteria is uh, very different than what I showed you just before. Here you are free to submit as many sheets you want. So this uh, doesn't have any presentation. So uh, here the winning uh, criteria was the sheets in themselves. How did I present the sheet? How was the explanation done just visually, right? Because you don't get to explain what it is. The person looking at it should see it and understand exactly what I'm trying to say. And the more the communication is successful, the more the chance of winning the competition is for you. Um, slowly transitioning towards from my master's days. Now, these are all the competitions that I did in my master's time. And this was just right before the master's thesis was supposed to happen. This was another huge project we took. Um, and this was a group project. So, but the amount of work was huge. It was immense. But still, we were working on um, uh, building a uh, zone which had uh, residential units and it had uh, sports facilities and it had healthcare facilities. So that's uh, where I shine, right? So we took up this project and um, I intentionally took up this project because I wanted to work with the professor for my thesis. So that was one of the reasons that I chose this subject in the first place to, you know, get acquainted with the professor whom you want to work with so right after this we worked with him fortunate enough to work i was really fortunate enough to work with him learned a lot and my master's thesis was a research-based thesis and what i did later on which was my intention from the first time in itself uh, when i was preparing it was that i turned it into a paper once i was done with my master's because uh since i'm the I want to chance uh, take a chance on doing PhD and it's not easy to get a PhD. So uh, having a paper before you apply for PhD is very important. Um, not very compulsory, but then it really gives you a boost in your uh, proposal if you have a paper. Well, when I applied for the PhD, I didn't have this. I was just writing the draft. So it was in the process of making. But... Um, uh, now it's different. Now I have certain publications. Uh, people who are interested in research, uh, ResearchGate is where we put our work together. You can see some of my work if you're interested. Now it's uh, mostly the papers you would see is based on Hong Kong and the older population and the care home facilities and the policy implications and stuff like that. So that's the transition which happened from the masters from all the competitions and design 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 to the other side of my career which is now right 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 research 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 i happened to do some competitions as well as just i mentioned in my first year i don't think i did anything last year it's all about writing papers i think that's the new competition for me so now transitioning to the phd side of it in polyu uh if you ask me um uh, as Tapati asked already uh how and why uh the topic how it came and exactly um how did i land up to getting the phd and that proposal so now by now i hope you know that i have this uh, my life revolving around architecture of all these years having experience in practice and teaching and um worked on healthcare projects and facilities. I have been also associated with old age homes and volunteering for over 15 years uh, in several places that I've stayed. Um, also, I have had this opportunity and luxury of experiencing the East and West, uh, Western way of life. So I think I, when I was writing for the proposal after the master's, I sat and took all these things. Uh, what are my pluses right it's again like selling your product so it's like again another competition a larger competition um you're the only one participating so i was thinking what are my higher ups what are my pluses so these were the things that i had in me so uh, i used my background as architect and urban designer with the the context of uh, aging population because aging population is a problem that uh, is going to haunt every nation uh, but then it's going to come to india a little bit later 
because if you talk about numbers, India is a young country. Uh, so as much as it is needed to work on the older people and all the population in India, uh, we still have the luxury of uh, me doing the PhD first in Hong Kong and then worrying about the Indian older population in the next five years because uh, we are also heading towards uh, a large number of people aging uh, and aging beyond 60 or 65 up. So that's why uh, when I was pro uh, preparing the proposal, I made it Hong Kong because it is already an aging society and the unique spatial context, if you are aware of Hong Kong, it's quite unique and it's interesting for an architect. You would be excited to uh, see the space, not very excited to propose solutions because the constraints are quite serious and high. So, but yeah, that was one of the reasons why I chose PhD and my topic and how it came about. So currently what I'm looking towards is to use the theoretical base that already has been there uh, in the West. The aging problem uh, started way before in the West and hence they have a lot of studies being done. So um, I think that was uh, that's the idea to use the existing knowledge from the West and to learn from the uh, practitioners and users from the context itself to know the best practices and come up with solutions and with certain keywords like aging population, built environment, Hong Kong, overall well-being. These are the keywords that I'm working on. This is, um, I wanted not to promote exactly, but well, yes, promote uh, PolyU as well, since I'm working here. It's a good opportunity. All the universities that have been to, I want to promote PMCA, I want to promote PolyMe, and I want to promote PolyU as well. So look forward, if you're interested in master's or a PhD in any of the institutes, um, don't send me uh, WhatsApp messages of I want, I'm interested. I get that quite often, do your homework. And then if you have very interesting, larger than life questions, please do drop by and ask me anytime. I'm there for answering, but then do your homework first. Uh, you're just one Google search away. Be very, very interested in looking towards all the uh, uh, scholarships available from different universities and uh, several um, requirements that you have. In Polymy, there is a requirement of certain marks. So if you don't have that uh, level of score, you can't apply. I think that's valid for most of the universities. So uh, make sure you do your homework make a excel sheet that's very research perspective but then just take out a word document have your tables ready and then look about all the universities that you're interested go to qs rankings and look about uh, the universities that are top ranked in india and outside if you're interested and um, then uh, approach uh, take the approach basing on the university's profile. I think it's very important. No university is same. The application processes are different. They would ask different things. They would look on different things to take you in. And if you have any seniors there, do approach them. They would maybe know some tips and tricks to get into the universities quicker or earlier. Uh, some tips, right? This is one of the program grant that I applied for uh, during my polio PhD study in my second year. Yeah, uh, this is there, there are several other grants. Once you start your PhD as well, you can apply for several grants and uh, go across other universities to do your research uh, if that helps to your study. So what I did was I applied for this grant, another competition, right? So I applied for this grant and fortunately I got this grant and I got to visit University of Manchester. Uh, and it's not moving. Okay. So why University of Manchester, you might ask? It was because I was really following this professor who works in my field in the Western context. So I proposed a visit to him. I would anyway go, but then I also applied for this grant so that I have the financial independence again. So I applied for this uh, grant as well. So post arrival uh, UOM, uh, University of Manchester. This is the part I want to show. You might have exp same experience coming from other cities to Hyderabad. Um, it's always the same. Leaving your own comfort zone is always um, difficult, different. 
uh, challenging and positive. I think that you make new friends and all of that. So something that I was unaware of uh, Manchester was that I stayed for the longest of time in, uh, not longest of time, but for several, several years in uh, Italy. And uh, the weather is completely different, right? I never expected UK to be something else. Uh, but it was always great and it was always raining. So I think the change of environment was something uh, you don't realize, but it's a big um, thing that goes on inside the change. We had our own sunny days as well in the campus. It was brilliant when it was sunny. Uh, the role of friends, family and teachers are immense in this. Right? When you have a change of place, you miss your old friends, you make your new friends, you are detached from your family, you have new teachers, you have old teachers. It's a mix of emotions. And um, what I also did was I felt the gratitude. I met uh, some old people. You would see some PMCNs here. Uh, some of them who are doing job some of them who are doing postdoc so it's a, it's a it was a nice experience to meet the old friends i met some amazing new friends on the way uh some four legged friends as well it was it was all in all a very fulfilling experience this was my office again change of the setup from what i have in hong kong versus what i have in manchester um uh, it's not always fun it's all mostly serious work going on discussions presentations and more presentations but fun at sometimes so i think um the best uh takeaway from the experience for manchester was being able to travel i guess you are also doing that right make sure you're traveling as well you're looking at the architectural wonders near hyderabad in hyderabad and um, that's what even I did in uh, Manchester and around Manchester. Uh, went to all these brilliant places, had some good time, uh, good memories. And I think to sum it all, it was uh, really a great, fulfilling, fun learning experience. Manchester and the past 15 years, I've been enjoying, um, although struggling and uh, crying and depression and anxiety are the other gray words that we don't speak about but overall it's been a wonderful experience so this is what i present uh, in many sessions where i present uh, throughout the world i think um, this is what happens so in theory whatever i said um, it should be the same as practice, right? So when you do apply all these uh, things in your life, it should be the same because that's what I said. But that never happens. That's not in practice. So it's a very personal journey that I shared. All the steps, all the things that I did that worked for me, that didn't work for me. So maybe what I want from this uh, session is that you take this, um, take this chance uh, of just listening to what happened just now and then pick up things as ever you like and make your own trajectory and it will definitely be not the same as mine or anybody else's it will be very much yours but I think owning it would be as fulfilling as it is for me so I think I would end up my session there and I'm looking forward to you asking at least some questions thank you Yes, uh, thanks a lot, Moana. It was a very nice presentation. Okay, moving on. Uh, students, if you have any doubts, any questions, you can post it on the chat box or you can unmute yourself and just ask directly. I was very clear, it seems. <laughs> I think I think they understood everything. <laughs> so maybe they don't have any questions. But yeah, I would like to ask you something. Uh, yeah. So yeah, so I saw your presentations, your sheets. So can you just explain ki what kind of softwares do you use? I mean, is it necessary to master in those softwares? Or yeah, yeah. yeah. Or if you are just a beginner or an intermediate person who can know those softwares, can you just start working on it? And how was the design process? How did you figure it out? Where do you require presentation skills? Where do you require other analytical skills? Anything about on those lines? 
Yeah, so uh, coming to the soft press, I think uh, that's an important question to ask. Um, the ones that I used, I'm very basic. I'm very, very basic. I know the, the mother soft press, but I know it very well. I think that's my selling point. So there are friends who would know like Revit. Uh, that, that's also a very basic software nowadays. Not when I was doing my art architecture courses um nowadays you would do grasshopper and all of these uh additional i know everything so the more software you know it's just a tool right so you can do most of it in cad as well so you don't need to be very worried about um softwares the series of softwares that you know that that doesn't help you much yeah it helps you to get a job so if you have rhino if you know rhino and you put it in your cv i think that's a plus to get certain forms in India and abroad, right? So that's that's one addition. But um, to to portray what's in your head, to show what's what's your design process and what's your idea into paper, it doesn't matter whichever tool you use. It has to be logical enough. It has to be uh, just presented on the sheet, right? So you can use any of the softwares, but know it very well. So I think uh, the the sheets that you saw. Uh, mostly it is uh, from SketchUp, I took it to Lumion and from Lumion to Photoshop. So that's how uh, the process is for all the presentations that you saw. But I think I'm very proud of my Photoshop skills. I think I'm, I'm brilliant in Photoshop. So I can do anything that a person would do in any other software. And um, a little bit being confident on what you do is also important because I can either be intimidated by a person who knows Grasshopper, knows Rhino, and and or be confident about what I can do with my software that I know. So I think that's that's an important question to ask, but then um, not an important thing to know or not know. If you know whatever software you have within your reach, um, I think that you should know it very well. You should know how to use that software. People are working there. They're working really hard to make the softwares brilliant day by day. So use whatever softwares you know to the maximum. I think that should help quite a lot. And uh, the second question was, uh, apart from the software, you asked. Yeah. Yeah, apart from the software, uh, you participated in design competitions, right? So you told uh, that sometimes you need to present sheets. So how did you figure it out ke which design competition has more importance on whether just presentation or whether they have more importance on those analytical aspects of the design? Ah, so uh, I think uh, for any competition, the 80% importance has to be on the sheet that you presented so some uh, competitions have different formats so that you already know when you're applying for the competition you would just know the format is it like a presentation based or is it uh submission based so you just submit and then the jurors will do their job or you submit the jurors will do their job and then you present and then the jurors will sum it up and say you won or not sorry so um the presentation comes later uh but uh, presentation personally in per, I mean in person comes later but the sheet has to be self-explanatory so that is uh, without saying uh, that goes without saying so whenever you are doing any competitions when I do any competition um, I often give it to my friends who are non-architects once the sheet is done and just to see if they understand the sequence they don't need to understand the technicalities but then if the sequence is right if it's portrayed well enough i think that's what you need um the jurors are looking out for that if it's comprehensive enough if it has the flow or not so i think that's very important it's not only related to competitions i think any design semester projects that i did or i do any project if i do any of the projects i think presentation is the way to, because end of the day, you, are, you want to sell your product, right? So being a good salesman is almost about how you speak and you sell it, but then also the content, right? If the content is bad, a good salesman would still be able to sell it, but then it's better to sell good products. So the idea should be really good. Uh, it has to be logical. And then the sheet should speak for itself. You should not be dependent on, okay, I will explain when the presentation day comes. Maybe your sheet won't be selected for the things that you didn't put it in the first place. It's a brilliant idea otherwise, but since you missed out 
on certain things that was necessary was put out in the brief but you chose i'll do it later i'll explain it later you won't be given that chance for the later basically so if you are given the chance if you are selected already in the prelims then use your extreme energy to make the presentations right to make the presentations uh come towards you to making you win the uh, project even more right so that's like a second chance given to you uh to explain and get the jurors to your side so that's how i think i take on my projects or presentations or anything related to architecture or like yes uh very nicely explained i have just another question <laughs> yeah so uh, i saw ki you have written many uh, research papers right so uh, you also told ki you took a master thesis and wrote a research paper on it if you have a thesis then i think it's kind of like ki half of the work is already done maybe you have something ki you already know what you need to write what you need to do in that research paper but can you tell us ki how did you convert your thesis to research paper the process in which you determined ki how will you go forward and write the paper yeah so as i uh, briefly mentioned my it was a very pre planned murder scene uh, it was a very pre planned thing that i did so i had this professor in my mind in my first year and it said that thesis i'm going to do it with this guy so uh, eventually i chose the subject that he teaches uh, because it's related to what i like so of course it was again on health city and health infrastructure and blah, blah, blah. so um when i approached him i worked with him to develop the topic in a way that can be a research based thesis so already i'm starting my work in a way that the end product is a paper i'm telling the person who is going to supervise me that i want it and he is a academic he he wants to do it anyway so he would be more than interested to help me so what happens in the way is that i learn from the master right like he's one of the biggest name in europe to work with so that that's how uh, i think a pre planning of what you want to do is quite important impromptu stuff as well works out happens but this is also a good way to take on the the decisions so um uh, the topic i got i already made it clear that i want to make it a research based thesis so then i took up on the topic did the research and then um since it was a research based thesis so it was all words already so it was around several thousand words around 60000 words or something i don't remember so it's then uh, you're working for a degree you're working for a thesis to get the degree and um it helped me because uh, i think i um again coming back to the score students uh i got uh, the highest possible score in masters but because i chose to do the research oriented thesis and it was with one of the best people i know so the, i think the quality was okay so uh what happened was i got um It, it's called cum laude it, it's a european uh, thing it's more than gold medal i think it's uh, when you get the highest possible score this is beyond that when you exceed the highest possible score you get cum laude so i received that because of the uh, master's thesis that we did i think that was the um, last feather to add so um so that thesis in itself helped me to uh work with a wonderful team of people who i am still in contact with they are my people they work with my topic one the second one was give me a good score i don't know why i'm focusing on that so much in this presentation it actually doesn't matter so much but then just because i'm doing this for the students i think focus on marks yes um that's there so that was the second i think the third one was um uh, i was very clear i want to do phd so having a paper helps so then i turned the research paper a uh, research thesis that i had it was just to squeeze the water out of that and make a paneer out of it so like i just squeezed it and made it with maybe 12000 10000 words a research article so 
that's how it is. But then to squeeze from 60,000 to 10,000 word, it took me almost one and a half years because I was just learning. And writing paper is so different when you are from master's level student who was always doing... In competition, you are talking less on words, you are doing more on visuals. And the transition from there to uh, research thesis and to uh, write a lot more, I think that's a big transition in itself. So it took me some time. Um, now it's way more easier for me to write papers. I think now I can say it comes naturally to me. But at that time, I took two years. If you see the papers, um, year of publishing, it, got published last year 2022 and my thesis was done in 2020 so the first one always takes time uh, but then again I think my trajectory from all these 15 years now it's taking another uh, turn and I'm quite enjoying this turn as well so happy there yes uh, if anyone wants to ask any question you can just unmute yourself Okay, I think <clears throat> let's move forward. So moving forward, uh, I would like to uh, ask director sir to give a vote of thanks. Yeah. Uh, hi, Mohana. Yeah, this is Alak Nanda. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it was really a very nice presentation. I, I'm really very, you know, uh, it, it was very in, uh, informative also. And it was amazing. Thank you very much for giving us such a good presentation. It is so inspiring. Your journey is so inspiring. So I have a question, actually. Uh, yeah. I just wanted to know uh, if somebody uh, wants to pursue the PhD at outside, I mean, at abroad, what yeah. are all the exams they are supposed to give and how they are supposed to apply? What is the journey? I mean, what is the process? How to get the scholarship and how to select the college basis on what? I think uh, there's a... Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, uh, the big difference between pursuing master's and a PhD is different in the sense that for master's, the university is very important. Uh, the ranking and uh, university requirements is very important for master's. For PhD, it's uh, the professor that you're looking to work with is very important, uh, irrespective of the university. Having a good university is a big bonus, but then that is not going to help you uh, much. So the professor, the supervisor you're going to work with, or the other way around, if you are interested in a particular topic, for me, I wanted to work with public health and all my idea about the healthcare uh, facilities design that I did so far. So I wanted to incorporate that and I prepared my proposal like that. And then I started looking for people who are working related to this. Um, and then you approach the professor uh, for PhD. If the professors agree, then you look for the that particular university's uh, requirements. And it is... Uh, you will be amazed. It's so different from one university to the other. It's it's very different. Uh, so the things that they ask for, the things that they consider for scholarships. Also, life becomes a little easier if you're not worrying about the financial side of it for master's for PhD. If you are work, doing a PhD by uh, your own means, then I think getting a PhD is uh, a little easier because professors would not have to look for funding, professors will not have to pay you for the work. So getting those is easy. I have a friend from Harvard and then um, it was finally, I think it took him some time to uh, get um, the PhD. So, you know, like having a background of such strong background also does not entitle you to get the next step forward easily. So, making our right proposal and asking the right people, right supervisors, and um, getting the fundings. If the, uh, it, it also depends on the timing. Maybe if the professor is just right for you, but then the, uh, sometimes it happens, the professor doesn't have funding. Then it's on you uh, 
uh, to see if you want to still work with him without pay or if you want to work with somebody else with pay. You compromise. Then you have to start bringing in the compromise part with money being involved, with stipends being involved. Yeah, thank you for the answer. But I still have a, a very silly doubt. How to select yeah. the professor based on your PhD topic? I mean, how do you uh, know that 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 guide uh, is going to guide you properly? That person is guide, guide going to guide you properly? How to know ah, that? So that's a very big leap of faith, honestly, because uh, to find a professor who works in your uh, field that's easy so whatever field you're working uh, on right now or you're making your proposal you go to all these platforms uh, in any of the journals leading journals and see the papers and see the professors who are writing the papers that means that they are the experts in that field right if they're writing journal top journals uh, if they're getting to write in top journals so they are your people and then you approach them but um, I lost my train of thoughts. So your question was, how do you know the professor will guide you or not? Yeah. So that is a very um, fishy side of academia. So the professor might be highly ranked, highly influential professor, but then he's not a good supervisor. Might as well happen. So then uh, that happens post joining. Actually, you will just realize that your supervisor is going to be for your name or the supervisor is going to be for the work that he's going to teach you so either way you have to sail your ship as ever you feel like um but then that's like post getting the phd but before getting phd it's all about looking at the field looking at the people who are working on the similar field and approaching them that if they want to supervise you or not that's the only way to do it there's no other way to do it and uh, how the supervisor will turn that's completely your luck i think that's uh, that so many of us we cry a lot because of the supervision it's a very different thing than the profile that the person has or holds yeah thank you very much for the answer and one more question i would like to ask you so you have a very good experience in publishing paper internationally so yeah. uh, which type of paper is a good paper, uh, quantitative or qualitative? I mean, where you have a lot oh, of... Oh, that, that, that's okay. going to be a work, straight out war between the qualitative researchers and quantitative researchers. So there is no one good way to uh, say that this is supreme, right? So it depends on the field that you are. So in social sciences, so now what my uh, PhD is taking which I'm very happy about. It's uh, taking a interdisciplinary term, uh, turn. So it's a bit of social sciences because I'm involving older populations and doing, yeah. I'm using some of the qualitative uh, methods for that. And then I have my own um, architecture background and I have very quantitative side to look on that as well. So I'm doing a mixed method approach for my PhD. So I'm in the middle ground, right? So I, I satisfy the qualitative guys and the quantitative guys both. Uh, but there is no one supreme method. There are It's about the topic that you're working on. So a particular topic uh, decides whether you are, you are going to take the quantitative because it will not, if you are trying to talk about something very deep, which is very in-depth uh, uh, understanding of a feeling of how mothers feel about their child, if you're topic is something like that then you cannot do a quantitative method even if you think yeah. that quantitative method is supreme it's the best you can't because you can't put a number to a mother's feeling to a child you can't everything will be uh, if you give a scale they will just put it 10 then you don't get to uh, yeah. analyze so yeah. then you would have to take qualitative approaches so you would have to take interviews and other means to understand the depth of it so it depends on the topic. It, nothing is, um, no one uh, method is supreme. It's all there in the plate. To just pick one depending on your topic. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, uh, so moving on, I think we had a very fruitful discussion. We started from your own journey, <clears throat> your bachelor's, your projects, and then we ended up in PhD discussions. So yeah. it was very, sorry. No, yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a very nice discussion, to be honest. I think most of us got an idea what we need to do, how we need to do that. So I really, <clears throat> sorry, I would really like to thank you for joining us today. So moving on, I would like to express my appreciation to all the participants who joined the webinar series. Now on behalf of Heatham School of Architecture, I would like to close my remarks and officially announce the end of webinar. Wishing the future prosperity of all the participating students, I further extend my gratitude to our esteemed speaker, 
for today <clears throat> and faculties of school of architecture hyderabad thank you very much for joining us today and giving us a precious time and i really hope people did understand anything everything that they need to do <clears throat> yeah would you like to say something more no 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 i think no, most of it uh, most of them they understood much of it it's just they don't want to speak i think they understand very well i i, I hope they did so when if they get at least like one or two words out of this and then maybe do the next uh, presentation on the uh, design course and maybe change the layout a bit i think that that will also serve the purpose yeah indeed that would yes so uh, <clears throat> i will announce the end of the webinar thanks a lot again moana for joining us my pleasure okay. yes thank you thank you